You're listening to their Auto Be a Law, the Center for Auto Safety podcast with Executive Director Michael Brooks, Chief Engineer Fred Perkins, and hosted by me, Anthony Simino. For over 50 years, the Center for Auto Safety has worked to make cars safer. Is that what that was? Did you ever figure out what that hundred yeah. was? So last week we're recording and we're recording right now. Hi, listeners. Uh, Good morning. And we're talking about the Hyundai Kia thefts. And I noticed after we finished recording outside my window on the corner is there's a running Hyundai. Uh, back windows are open. The engine's running. And I'm th- I, f- I ignored it first because I'm like, ah, oh, maybe somebody just ran into a store. But then three hours later, it's still there. Engine's still running. Window's still open. So I go outside because I'm going off to do things. And in the front seat, I notice a USB cable sitting there. And I'm like, wow, this is clearly some kids stole this car. They listened to this show. Or some nice listener said, hey, you want a free car? Listen to this podcast. And uh, they left it there. But uh, this is amazing, though. This is, I mean, the kids have gotten better. Because in the past, I've watched them literally steal these cars and crash into barriers um whereas this one they parked it more or less on the side of the road and you know they, they didn't turn spot? it off no it was an illegal spot it was illegal um traffic cops came by looked at it and didn't ticket it because you know that's paperwork i guess i don't know uh, but yeah there was i eventually i reported it to the police and they showed up and they got all very confused and other people in the neighborhood like yeah it's been there since this morning since that podcast was recorded <laughs> and it was still running. Still running, yes. Yeah, so they hadn't stole it. caught on fire. <laughs> <laughs> and it was still running, hadn't caught on fire. Um, but as I pointed out, uh, I was like, yeah, but they left the engine running because somebody pointed out, yeah, how are they going to turn it off? They don't have keys. Yeah. They- it's like, was there anybody from Guinness nearby for the world record <laughs> on idling without uh, catching on fire spontaneously? That no, that was good. But I mean, I also they left their USB cable behind, which I was like, come on, guys, that's. Oh, they're always useful. Five bucks right there. But the anyway, USB cable. Yeah. yeah, I mean that's <laughs> that's still going on. We we just saw this past weekend. There were at least I think two deaths related to Hyundai Kia thefts. Yeah, so let's just jump right into the more Hyundai Kia. Um, we got a couple articles we're linking to. Um, uh, let's see, there one is in KOAT Action News Seven. The most action news in the morning. Uh, in Albuquerque, a stolen car went through a stop sign around 2 p.m., crashed into another car. Front passenger of the car that was crashed into was killed, unfortunately. Um, but again, this is another uh, Hyundai Kia car. Yeah, I mean, it, it, we, I looked at that story, and no one is, that I've seen, at least in the media, is identified but pretty clearly a uh, Kia Optima vehicle that was involved in that crash. Uh, uh, so we're waiting to hear more about that one. But, you know, that's an innocent bystander, innocent driver that's been struck um, at a sign by someone in a potentially stolen Kia. So um, and that's not, and, and this isn't just happening, you know, once or twice a year. I mean, we know confirmed, I believe there have been at least eight deaths connected to this, and we think there are probably many more. In fact, at the end of the year, when the data comes out, we'll be doing a search in the federal data to see, you know, where stolen vehicles are reported in fatal crashes and how the Hyundai key is line up in that. But, you know, I, I think we are, you know, just a spitballing i think we could probably connect 20 deaths or more since this started uh, a year and a half or so ago to to these stolen vehicles so it's and that doesn't count the other crimes that have been committed so these things are continuing to happen again and again that's amazing the other story we have is out of uh six abc another action news everybody's action news uh in philadelphia uh, Pennsylvania State Police say a 14-year-old was behind the wheel of a car that crashed, uh, causing the eastbound lanes of the Scully Kill Expressway to be closed for hours. Skokal, uh, Skokal, please. Skokal, Skokal, Skokal. Anyway, I-76. Uh, troopers tied, uh, attempted to stop a black Hyundai Sonata, um, and the vehicle was reported. So the vehicle fe- failed to yield to emergency lights and sped away from officers. Uh, perhaps it was a Tesla. Uh, the driver then class control and crashed into a barrier. Um, no one was, uh, the kid was, eje- the 15 year old was ejected from the car. Oh, 
Yeah, oh not God. wearing a seatbelt, I'm sure. And it was a 14 year old girl driving the car who's now charged with vehicular homicide. Um, that's when TikTok goes wrong, I think. And it's, you know, it's just terrible that most of the most, I think it was something like half of the humans that are stealing these vehicles are, are, under the age where they could even be licensed. So this is another one of those. And this is also a case of where, you know, maybe is this a case where the police should have chased the vehicle? It's a stolen vehicle. Is that something that rises to the level where they needed to do this? Um, we don't know. We, we don't know the um, all of the circumstances, but that's another issue that we discussed last week. Well, two lives ruined for the, price of the profit that Kia made on one car. This seems like a really bad idea. This, I, I don't know. I don't know why they haven't been forced to recall it. And I don't know why Kia made the decision to save that small amount of money, the pittance associated with keeping the um, immobilizer out of the vehicles. Uh, when you personalize it, it's obvious these two kids one of them literally, you know, dead, the other whose life will be ruined by the judicial system and the bad decisions she made as a 14 year old. For what? How much money did they make? A couple thousand dollars on these cars? Please, th this is just insanity. Yeah, this might not be a popular view, but I think more and more corporations need to lose their business licenses. Um, but hey, I'm just a guy talking to a microphone. Um, uh, so, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's unfortunate. Um, again, if you own one of these Hyundai Kias, uh, go to your dealer, scream, yell, and do not accept just the club as the answer. Okay. Th that's just insulting. If anything, they have uh, a fix to these. Am I right, Michael? They have some sort yes, of fix for almost, almost all of the vehicles. I believe right. it's like eight out of the 10 million that are affected. They have a fix for, but it's. Um, not all vehicles can be protected with the software update. And, you know, we still have some lingering questions about the software update. We don't think it's 100% effective. We're concerned that it may be not even 90% effective, um, but we're continuing to monitor to see reports of people who've had the update and then had their vehicle stolen, which we've seen a number of times already. So would your suggestion be, so we have eight of the 10 million that can be fixed, those remaining 2 million that can't be fixed, would your suggestion would be to uh, leave all the windows rolled down, leave a USB cable in the driver's seat and just walk away? You know, between <laughs> some of the engine problems with a lot of these vehicles and the theft problems, I, I would just stick to the, the last two words of that sentence. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fair enough. Um, hey, let's, uh, oh, well, you know, well, since we're talking about uh uh, traffic fatalities let's just continue with this so there's an article that we uh we didn't get to last week that we mentioned uh this was about uh new cars being safer potentially but uh pedestrian cyclist deaths being on the rise and this is an article from the ap and i'm going to quote from it here many studies have shown that larger vehicles like suvs and pickups are more likely to kill or serious seriously injure pedestrians and cyclists when they're involved in a crash um the design of these vehicles can also pose visibility problems. An Insurance Institute for Highway Safety study of crashes with pedestrians at intersections found that the vehicles most likely to be involved in left turn crashes were SUVs and pickups, suggesting they might have a harder time seeing some of those pedestrians. And we've discussed this issue ad nauseum. So that's not getting better. No, I mean, there's nothing. There's nothing compelling the industry to make it better. There are no standards for visibility, what the driver sees when they're looking out of a vehicle, you know, whether the vehicle is too high, whether the hood's too long, whether the windows are structured in a way that allows drivers to see everything around them. You know, we already, all, all of us know we have a blind spot, you know, or we should. That's why we have blind spot monitors. There are other blind spots in your vision when you're driving a vehicle. And um, particularly on these turns, not just SUVs and pickups have had these problems over the years, city buses. And I, I think a school bus actually killed a 17 year old high school student just a couple of days ago, um, making a left turn. Um, it's, 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 there's a particular blind spot in turning that, that happens on these larger high vehicles that prevents them from seeing 
um, pedestrians and, you know, whether there's technology that can solve it or whether the vehicles can be designed with better visibility, um, we think that something needs to be done because the, the pedestrian, you know, even though the, you know, the crash fatality rate overall appears to be coming down a little from some of the highs during the pandemic, we're still seeing a rise, a massive rise and a scary rise in incidents involving pedestrians and bicyclists and all, all the other folks who are out on the road and not in a car. Right. So further in the article, there's this interesting little paragraph it says NHTSA has proposed new pedestrian crash avoidance tests, but they would be voluntary and not part of the agency's five star rating system. So, I mean, wh why why even make these voluntary rules like, hey, here's a really good idea to save people's lives. But, you know, just do it if it's convenient. If I don't know if you're not busy putting Mario Kart in the entertainment <laughs> system, like why, well, why so? I, I think in that case that they propose the crash avoidance tests, but they're not basically what they're not going to do is say, this is how vehicles perform. Every other end cap test, they come out with five stars. Oh, your side impact rating is a three. Not so great. You got some things you need to work on. In this case, they were talking about simply publishing a list of the good guys, uh, but not rating vehicles, which doesn't make a lot of sense to us. It's kind of against the spirit of NCAP, you know, getting a bad rating incentivized, incentivizes the manufacturer to improve. Maybe they're suggesting that, you know, it's this situation simply can't be improved. I might be more willing to accept that. Um, and the answer to that would then be we need to make vehicles, you know, the, the average vehicle size on the road smaller to avoid not just these visibility incidents, but also a lot of the crash consequences of having heavy vehicles matched up against small vehicles. So uh, I'm not, we, we weren't fans of that proposal. We, we think it goes against the spirit of NCAP, what NCAP's meant to do. And ultimately it's only giving, you know, sugar cream puffs to the vehicles that do well and then ignoring the bad guys that are actually out there killing people. Well, Hunt Smaller, excuse me, Smaller, yes, uh, that has a lot of virtues, but there's also a lot of design features that can be built into cars to make, uh, to minimize the consequence of impact on pedestrians and bicyclists. Uh, I read one story about Subaru, which is putting airbags on the outside of cars so that they can protect the um, pedestrians or other people who might be impacted by the cars. But the technologies there it would be an interesting, interesting approach, but that's only one of many design features that can be built into cars to protect people outside of the car. Uh, we've talked about how the SUVs may protect the people inside the car, but the, it's a zero-sum game to some extent. And when you're protecting people inside the car preferentially, it means you're increasing the jeopardy to people outside of the car in many cases. So they really should expand the design scope to include protective measures for pedestrians and bicyclists and other vulnerable road users who might be impacted by the vehicles. Well, I mean, they do have, at least there's a lot more of them in New York, is they have these uh, white lines on the road, and uh, it says, hey, this is the uh, bicycle lane, and no car ever drives into the bicycle lane. So that, you know, it's a it's an imagination uh, protection system. Yeah, imaginary is good. Um, <laughs> I think dedicated lanes are probably, I mean, obviously, they're more expensive, and there's a lot of opposition to them in some areas i know that in the northern virginia area sometimes we've i've seen opposition to you know taking one lane where cars would be moving and replacing it with a bike lane which which um people don't like uh but also you know it, it's like anthony says cars do veer off the road cars don't see bicyclists cars don't respect lane markings all the time and having dedicated bike lanes away from traffic to me would is is the ultimate goal whether that can be implemented in practice in you know cities that are already overcrowded where property is very expensive is a completely different situation well europe's found that you really need a physical barrier to protect the pedestrians and bicyclists uh, effectively uh, it, it really needs especially in north virginia uh, it really needs comprehensive planning because a lot of the streets that do have marked bike lanes 
however inadequate they might be, at least are marked, and spontaneously at intersections with no place to go. And you, you really need to have a regional approach to make sure that the bike lanes are consistent and comprehensive enough so that you you know it makes sense to use them and it makes sense to respect them. Agreed all around. And uh, I think that's two votes for socialism here is, uh, let's see, Michael promoted smaller cars and Fred mentioned Europe. Um, so clearly you guys hate my freedoms in this country to drive wherever I want, whenever I want, however I want. Um, anyway, I, I think it's uh, just the freedom to, to run over people who are choosing a different mode of transportation than you that we don't like. Yeah. Different is bad, right? Different is bad. <laughs> Come on. Hey, but no, it's not bad, folks. Going to autosafety.org and clicking that donate button, that is good. It will it will uh, improve your complexion. Your sleep will be better. Your posture will improve. Your friends and neighbors will go, hey, what's different about you? Did you get a haircut? And you'll say, no, I donated to the Center for Auto Safety. And they'll be like, uh, okay, that's, but you still got a haircut, right? And you're like, yeah. Uh, continuing with this, so this is a little confusing because we were just talking about uh, the pedestrian deaths issues but NHTSA the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration uh, put out a press release showing that more miles driven combined with fewer traffic deaths resulted in a fatality rate of 1.2 fatalities per 100 million miles uh, down from the projected rate of 1.31 fatalities per 100 million miles in the first half of 2023. So what we're seeing very simply is people are driving a lot more but fatalities have gone down which is a good thing we're very happy about one thing i want listeners to keep in mind for when we talk about something else is they did this over 100 million miles so the next time you hear some tech bro being like we drove a million miles or five million miles keep in mind no one cares okay 100 million miles is the is the the threshold for anything with safety with vehicles so michael Okay, so pedestrian deaths have gone down, um, but oh, it's still. Oh. Uh, wait, they pedestrian. Sorry, pedestrian deaths have gone up. I'm sorry, but but traffic deaths have gone down. Right. Well, and pedestrian deaths are actually included in the overall traffic death number and estimate. That's so what I thought. That's why I'm confused. Um, yeah, so it, it, that shows that, well, it, it could show a lot of things. It could show that we, you know, if we were also protecting pedestrians as well as we should, then we would be getting much better numbers at this point and much far fewer fatalities. Um, but it also shows that, you know, that there is, you know, somehow there is a, a fairly significant decrease in fatalities and in, in vehicle to vehicle collisions or, you know, vehicle only collisions that, um, is impacting these numbers, which, you know, that's, that's a good thing. You know, we want that number going to go down to zero. Um, and the, the pedestrian numbers are holding that, you know, continuing to keep the number a little higher than it would be um, since we're not protecting pedestrians. So it's um, the overall numbers, you know, this is just their estimate. They'll come back with a final next year. Sometimes it takes about 18 months, I think, for that whole process to play out. But, um, you know, it's good news. We've had a lot of bad news since the pandemic regarding you know, traffic deaths and, you know, the injuries never really spiked the way the deaths did. It was, it was very suggestive of, you know, high speed, high impact type crashes that were driving this trend, a lot of reckless type driving that were driving the trend in vehicle crashes. And um, to see that come down is, is, you know, it's encouraging, but it's, you know, we're still a long way from where I think we should be given the technology we have. And the, the you know, I think it's, it's easier to educate consumers these days. There's a lot more helpful technology that can be included in vehicles to stop these crashes. And I think where we're failing is really getting that stuff out and into cars as fast as we can. Well, Michael, you're as always a cheerful optimist. And I wonder <laughs> if, uh, I wonder if this is actually the result of highway construction, because we know that when cars slow down, they're safer. And there's been a lot of highway construction that's taking place, particularly in urban areas right now, because of the uh, what was the infrastructure? What was the Inflation, Inflation Reduction, Reduction Act? Reduction Action Act. I'm sorry. Uh, so the the, 
it would be interesting to see this play out and see if it is just a beneficial impact of all of those traffic jams that we've been seeing uh, due to construction. That's yeah, because we talked ever- about that a few weeks back when we talked about the, the cities with some of the worst traffic, I believe, were the ones that had some of the lower fatality rates right. because yeah, that's you're right. keeping yeah. the cars slow. Mm-hmm. There <laughs> seems to be you're artificially real- keeping the cars slow. Well, you're not. It's not artificial, I guess, but you're keeping the traffic moving slowly because the, there's so many cars on the road. And it's so congested that they have to move slowly, which reduces speeds and reduces the chances of you know high speed impacts. Right. Yeah. So, um, I was in New York City over the weekend. And, and you didn't stop and say hi? I'll say hi now. Hi, Anthony. How are, yeah, how are you doing? Yeah, it's not good enough. A little late. Yeah, okay. But, you know, I just noticed there was plenty of traffic congestion to go around. So uh, I really think there's something to that. I don't think anybody's ever teased out the impact of highway construction on highway safety. It'd be an interesting study. Well, you're also just in New York, so it's just nonstop traffic. So, um no, it's it was no stopped way. traffic. Oh, ha, ha, ha. Uh, anyway, so I'm curious. So these numbers we're talking about, this 1.31 uh, one fatalities, and now it's their estimate is 1.24 fatalities per 100 mil- million vehicle miles. So historically, like we all realized that during the pandemic that people just decided to drive like they were in a video game. Uh, and it was <laughs> crazy on the roads, but uh, like historically, like 10 years ago, do you have any idea of what these numbers were? Are, are we trending downward overall? Is it flat? Uh, we're, you know, it's say, I believe it was around year 2000. We were at about 1.5. Okay. But by 2009, 2010, we were down around 1.11, 1.15, 1.14, 1.08 is the lowest I believe we've ever been in 2014. So that's 1.08 deaths per 100 million vehicle miles traveled. Um, That went up from 1.11 in 2019 to 1.34 in 2020 when the pandemic um, started. So that's when the uh, absent, uh, and it's hard to, it's, I don't want to solely blame it on the pandemic, but it's kind of an, it's kind of hard to see what else it could possibly be that's out there. Cause we were in this very declining state for, you know, 15 years there. And all of a sudden you have, you know, a, almost 20 percent leap in the number of fatalities or, or the rate of fatality so that suggests that it that the pandemic played a major role and now that we're kind of past that we're not quite you know it's not like we're just dropping back to the old number we're still up in 1.24 fatalities per 100 million vehicle miles traveled um and maybe you know maybe if we were only counting vehicles in this you know we might see that we've returned to normal and that, that it's the pedestrian deaths that are driving this um i'm sure there are multiple factors but that's definitely one of the areas that's keeping keeping that number high and high a lot higher than we'd like to see yeah uh but remember over that span that you uh talked about the average highway speed has gone way up because 55 mile an hour speed limit was uh, changed and vacated and during the pandemic there was a lot less highway congestion so people drove faster you know I, I think a lot of this may just be related to the average speed of the vehicles so I, I want to point out to listeners so we're talking about 1.3 1.2 it sounds like very low numbers but over the course of the year that's uh 40 thousand plus deaths a year so when we're talking about these large abstract numbers, it seems you can disassociate from what the actual impact is. What 40,000 deaths a year is like eliminating, uh, you know, a, a mid-sized city or a smallish type city completely off of the map. I Eau Claire, Wisconsin, for example. There you go. I was waiting for it. Eau Claire, Wisconsin. Um, that entire population gone. Right. Um, I, so keep that in mind. Like, so... Yeah, another way to think about it is 100 million miles sounds like a lot, but um, Americans are driving, you know, three plus trillion miles per year. So wait, three trillion with a T? Trillion, that's a T. Wow. Where are we going? 
just the Starbucks and Ikea? That's a good question. Yeah, that's what, that's what I want really. I would, like. I would like to see how many of those miles are necessary travel miles. <laughs> yeah, that's insane. Huh. Uh, but hey, you know what? In the future, everything will be better. And know what's going to make everything better in the future? Our friend Kyle. Kyle says everything's going to be better in the future. Kyle from GM's Cruise uh, Boondoggle. Um, last month, in an interview with the Washington Post, Ka- Chief Executive Kyle Vaught said many of the incidents involving his cars have been sensationalized and said that driverless cars will ultimately lead to safer roads in a city that experienced a spike of human driver-related road t- fatalities in 2022. That's right. This has been sensationalized. Well, let's get a little sensational then. Freak accident in San Francisco traps pedestrian under robo-taxi. Yep, that's right. No one inside this robo taxi, uh, pedestrian was hit by a vehicle driven by a human next to it. That person unfortunately bounced off of that car and got caught underneath the cruise robo taxi thing. Yeah, and so, and hit and run driver. I'll just mention yeah. that we don't know if it's a Hyundai Kia yet, but <laughs> yeah. So uh, I'd like to point out that okay, this is a horrible incident. The, the, the cruise slammed on the brakes, stopped. But you know what? There is nobody inside the vehicle. So there was nobody there to get out and help that person. Instead, they had to wait for emergency responders to show up. I don't know how the emergency responders were contacted. There's no mention of that because I, I don't imagine this car that drives itself into wet cement, hits fire trucks, gets stopped by a snow cone or a traffic cone, um, was like, hey, I think I ran over a human. I don't, uh, you know, I don't know. Maybe they have that in there. I would. It seems like something you would really, really want to put in a vehicle that's driving around without a human in it. Um, and and it, for this exact scenario, where you hit right, a pedestrian, well, or where there's a hit and run, in this case, where the other drivers fled, and so they're functionally the only the only party there that has the ability to report is the gm cruise vehicle because it's currently sitting on top of the victim i I want to point out that it stopped with the tire on top of the victim's leg if there had been a human in the car you can expect the human might have said gee the car stopped on top of this victim's leg perhaps i'll move the car now right so you know this is not a this is not a perfect example of the intelligence of AVs, or maybe it is. Yeah, from the uh, an article in The Verge that mentions this that we're linking to, uh, the driver struck a female pedestrian, throwing her in pass of a cruise robo-taxi that was operating autonomously. The cruise vehicle then braked with its rear tire still on top of the woman's leg. Um, after a cruise disabled the vehicle, rescuers were able to get the vehicle off the woman's leg using the jaws of life. Uh, that uh, there's so many things we have to unpack from that. I think as Fred just said, yeah, a human driver wouldn't be like, hey, let me leave my car that weighs a few tons on top of your femur. Um, and then, you know, the, that some cruise, some, somebody in a call center somewhere had to deal with, wait, I have to disable this car. No, we didn't roll over a person. Please hold. Press two if you'd like to speak in Spanish. I'm like, this is absurd. And then, because I guess the vehicle didn't move still, the fire department had to come out and use the jaws of life to move this. I don't know if anyone's ever seen the jaws of life in action. It's pretty cool. Um, but they'll use it to bend sheet metal and whatnot. So it's, I, this just seems like a giant failure in my opinion, but Kyle will tell me I'm wrong. Well, they've apparently Kyle has shown video of this to the Washington Post and some of the local papers and others out there. The video that we never get to see. And in this case, you know, it's not something you want to share publicly. I mean, there's obviously sure. a victim trapped under the car, but um, and, you know, that's not not a not really something fit for public consumption in many respects. But it would be, you know, it would be. <laughs> I think it would behoove crews to to share as much with as possible with you know NHTSA and you know the safety community on issues like this. Just to you know, maybe there maybe there are things that we would be able to notice in the video that they haven't. I'm sure we, we like to point out a lot of things that we think they haven't noticed. So, um, and 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 just 
it's it's complicated scenario and situation. We don't really know the extent of the injuries. We don't know, you know, if there were other people around. I mean, I'm sure it's in a larger city. There there were probably other witnesses. We we just don't know. Um, so once again, we're kind of operating in a vacuum where you know we get to hear what Cruz tells us and what they tell the media, but there's not really an opportunity for an independent you know verification of the facts on the ground here. No, but note that based on the, what's been reported, they use the jaws of life to remove this, uh, you know, to clear the pedestrian from the vehicle that was parked on top of her. If it had a human driver or it had access to controls that a human driver could use, there would be no need to use the jaws of life. I mean, good that it was there, but in a rational world, somebody would be able to get into the car, use the controls, roll the damn car off the poor woman's leg. There's there's just so much wrong about this that it's never going to go away with any amount of hand-waving from the tech bros. Right. I I can't imagine the amount of delay this would have put in with since there wasn't a human there. Uh, Like I said, there's a human driver in the car. That person's moving the car. They're getting out. So now the fire department's still going to respond because it's an emergency, but they're not wasting time setting up the jaws of life, which is not just like, hey, press a button. It's a big, heavy piece of machinery um, that's hooked up to hydraulics. So they're doing all of that, and then they have to do that, and then the EMTs can get involved. I mean, the amount of delay here just because, um, you know, hey, tech bro's got a tech bro is uh, unfortunate, to put it lightly. Unfortunately, yeah, the woman's on the road, either unconscious or screaming in pain while all this is going on. And uh, I actually, but it does bring to mind a great analogy for the cruise vehicles, uh, if you'll indulge me. There's a guy in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, who has a five-foot-long alligator that he uses as a comfort animal. Oh, no. And uh, and the guy says, and this is like the early adopters for the use of crews. He says, quote, he puts smiles on thousands and thousands of people, and he does it every day, he said, noting the number of Phillies fans entering the ballpark wanted to meet Wally. Now, Wally is the name of the alligator, and the gatekeepers at the Phillies stadium uh, apparently were smart enough to not let him in which created a certain (laughs) amount of controversy. But, uh, you know, the guy goes on to say, he puts smiles on the faces of thousands of people and does it every day. He's never harmed anyone, and he's never tried to. Now, to me, that sounds a lot like the advocates for the cruise automatic controls. Um, And then he goes on to say, Penny can understand why some may be skeptical of an alligator being on an emotional support animal, but encourage them to meet Wally. Quote, until then, stop bad-mouthing him, he said. Again, sounding just like Kyle. Ah. Um, and then, oh, I guess. There's some two odd things in this story to me. One, if I was going to take an alligator to a game in Philadelphia, it would definitely be an Eagles game that I'd want to turn it <laughs> loose at. And the other thing is that, you know, alligators aren't even native to Harrisburg, Pennsylvania area. <laughs> they can't even live there. So what? Well, Cruz is not native to San Francisco either. <laughs> so, yeah, you can. The analogy holds up. <laughs> so Jaws amazing. of Life led to Jaws of Wally. And I don't know, you know, it's interesting how people approach new stuff. But again, you know, the gentleman says until... Until he actually, until Wally actually starts biting somebody, stop bad mouthing him. He said. So oh. any reasonable person approaching this data would say, "Well, there's nothing wrong with a five foot alligator uh, being brought into the public and brought into public spaces." Sounds a lot like the cruise advocates to me. Yeah, I mean, oh. a five foot comfort alligator hasn't has never killed a human, as far as I know. Not yet. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, it probably won't ever. Right. <laughs> Five foot comfort alligator. Hey, congratulations. That's, That's the name man. of this episode. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. So, hey, this is, this is the cruise vehicles we're talking about are basically just modified Jaguars, um, not the animal, the uh, British car company that makes such good vehicles. 
Uh, but Cruz, as we've mentioned a number of times, oh, I think that's actually that's Waymo. That's I think. Waymo. I think oh, that's Waymo. What is Cruz? Oh, that's. Oh, I'm sorry. Right, Cruz uses General some, Motors, Anthony. Come General on. Motors, yes. General. <laughs> that's a big company yes. that's headquartered in Detroit. Right, right, and they, versus... they're spending two billion a year on on Kyle's comfort animal. It must uh, be nice. <laughs> Kyle's comfort company. Uh, so they we've talked about how they want. Full exemption from voter, federal motor vehicle safety standards because they want to put out the cruise origin. Yes, imagine the ugly side of a Honda Odyssey connected to an ugly side of the Honda Odyssey. Remove all steering wheels, all pedals, all controls. Have rows of seats that face each other. Use this as a carpool car and stare across from some stranger and breathe in their exhalations of garlic fries. Anyway, um... Not only do I think this is a stupid I- idea, so does the International Brotherhood of Teamsters. And they sent a lovely letter to the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration listing out why they think this is a bad idea. Um, part of it, it's great. You can just see right on page two, they have a bullet point, Cruise's safety record. And they list out a collision with a fire truck, vehicles becoming immobilized after driving into wet concrete, the blocking of emergency response vehicles to a pedestrian accident, which may have contributed to a pedestrian's death, vehicles losing connectivity and causing traffic jams near a music festival, malfunctioning cruise vehicles, impeding sanitation vehicles, and this gets personal, operated by members of Teamsters Local 350. Doesn't even mention driving over a woman's leg and parking there. Um, so uh, this is uh, this is interesting, um, you know. Not everybody's a fan of of, but I, I guess Kyle would say this is just sensationalism. You know, because that's that's what we all think of. We think of the Teamsters. We think they're they're a bunch of, uh, you know, uh, flag waving conspiracy theorists, sensationalists. Here they're opposing essentially some of the same things I think we are is that there's just not a lot of evidence that's been provided by GM on these origins. There's obviously we don't have federal motor vehicle safety standards for vehicles without steering pe- steering wheels brake pedals and a lot of other things that humans have to act interact with in a vehicle and you know they're functionally saying hey netza can we put one of these or a few of these on the roads and try them out um and see if they're safe even though we don't have any safety standards that apply to them and this is kind of a back and forth that's been happening waymo has been involved as well for about four or five years now they they've petitioned that's uh that's uh holds the petition for a year six months doesn't tell anyone in the public about it that's an aside <laughs> and then they move forward with a um you know a notice and comment period where uh they essentially the ultimate goal of this would be to decide whether or not crews can deploy this origin waymo i think submitted one and then withdrew it another company is it neuro fred that submitted an application for a vehicle that was had no human occupants and that one was approved that's basically a delivery drone type vehicle yeah neuro is correct carrying vehicles um but in this case it looks like this is going to be you know the the first one that's decided in, in regards to a vehicle with occupants in it um but and, you said a, you, know, you said a few vehicles but we're talking 2500 right isn't that the, the number i think so it's 2500 or so that can be exempted under 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 the provision they're seeking exemption from so that's something we're watching. We're not sure when Nets is going to decide on this. Kyle came out a few weeks ago and said that um, it was going to happen a week later. We still haven't seen that, so we don't know where that information came from. Um, but this, it, it, it's an, I, I think it's a, you know, the Teamsters has been very, very highly involved in, in, overseeing some of the things that are going on in california regarding the the trucks and the safety drivers they were 100 percent in support of the bill out there that would have kept safety drivers in heavy trucks um i think we would want safety drivers in all trucks all vehicles uh in in all of these cars right now i mean the, the origin as it stands there is no 
safety driver. There's no way for a safety driver to operate these vehicles. They are putting a vehicle out that um, does not envision the need for or, you know, essentially we'll never have a safety driver. Maybe they've got somebody remotely back at headquarters that can operate it in certain circumstances, but there's no one actively in the vehicle that can, um, you know, steer it to avoid a crash or to pull it off a pedestrian's leg that they're sitting on. So there's still a lot of concerns for us there. We just don't think the technology has matured to a point where it's, you know, safe to turn these things loose on streets. And the reason we don't think it's safe enough is because we just simply don't have the proof. We don't have evidence that has been provided by crews or any other of the autonomous vehicle companies that would ensure the public that we're going to be safe with these things on the road. And not just safe, but as far as crashes, but safe in terms of, you know, is this going to create congestion, congestion on our roads that blocks not just garbage trucks, but also ambulances, fire trucks, you know, how, how do we know that we can avoid what we've seen in San Francisco when these things are deployed on streets? Are they going to be worse? Um, we, we just don't know yet. So it's a difficult decision for the DOT to make, but I don't think it's made any easier by the fact that there's, you know, just not enough data out there or evidence that, that uh, for safety um, of these vehicles yet. I would, I would think as a minimum, as an absolute minimum, the company should be required by federal legislation to have some mechanism for emergency responders to take control of the vehicle in an emergency. That, I mean, uh, that, that seems like the absolute minimum requirement before you put these things on the road. As we've just seen in San Francisco, the damn thing stopped on top of a woman, uh, you know, who was injured. Uh, I mean, come on. This is not rocket science which I can swear to because I've got a rocket science heritage. There's, you know, <laughs> we, we should just do this and don't be, stop being stupid. I like this. So do you think, what, there's also other issues, you know, that some might think they're minor, but they, they, they're things like door handles. Like these, these vehicles are kind of totally computerized. You know, the, you don't open the door, the door opens for you. And when there's an event where someone in the vehicle needs to get out of it, we're not sure, you know, how are you going to do that? How are you going to accomplish leaving this box that a computer is in control over? I like um, that. You're, you you're channeling Yakov Smirnoff there. I, I did. I, did. I must rush out. But, in GM yeah, I mean, Cruise, the car doesn't open door for you. Wait, no, I can't do it. Nah, yeah, just stop. <laughs> but it's a, it's you know, there's just that's that's one minor question. There's also you know, a question about maybe that's not a minor question. It could be really major for someone who's trapped in one of these vehicles. Um, for instance, you know, this past weekend we saw an anhydrous ammonia leak that contributed to the deaths of five people um in the midwest uh after a trailer ran off the road and the tank was pierced and you know if you're in an autonomous vehicle in the area there and you and, and the vehicle stops you know in this plume of anhydrous ammonia you need to get out of the car and run away as fast as possible as far as you can how are you going to accomplish that um, there's just a lot of questions about escape and egress from these vehicles. You know, do they have a red stop button that pulls the vehicle to the side of the road and lets people leave it safely in the event of an emergency? Um, that's another. Well, and, and remember that a lot of the advocates for mobility for handicapped people have been saying these things are going to be the greatest things since sliced bread, but there's not been a nickel spent on emergency, safe emergency egress for people with any mobility problems or for people with the vision problems who might be the customers for these vehicles. Right. right. So and a big, a big red button doesn't help some people if they can't see where it is. So there need to be, you know, they really need to think out ways of enabling human passengers to respond and save themselves in emergency situations when the vehicle isn't capable of doing so. So, Michael, I have a question. So we're linking to this article about anhydrogenous, anhydrogenous, god damn it, ammonia. I, I, I just, I, I don't, I, I, yeah. I may not even pronounce it correctly. No, you, it's you anhydrous. Did, no, you did pronounce it correctly. My question was, how did you learn to pronounce that correctly? Because I use the internet to say, hey, wait, how do you pronounce this? Anhydrous ammonia. Is that Are right, you a tech bro? bro? Are you a tech bro, bro Anthony? Bro, bro, bro. 
bro. Bro. Is that how they do it? I don't, I don't, that's how an 11 year old girl talked to me the other day. And I was like, this is the strangest conversation I've ever been in. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. So this is, uh, this is interesting. This is okay. There's tractor trailer overturns. It's got hazard, hazardous material into it. You know, you're in a driverless car. What does that thing do? How does, I mean, it can identify wet cement. You think it's not going to just plow right through some sort of, um, what is it? It is a co- clear colorless gas that is toxic. I mean, it, it has no way to see this happening. I mean, it's just like, hey, something overturned, keep driving. And if it's, you know, if it's some liquid on the road, might just think, hey, maybe it rained in this part of the road. Not that it's, you know, some acid that's eating my tires. I'm melting. I'm melting. Right. But, I think hey. to be fair somewhat to a driverless vehicle in this situation, I don't know that the Why? humans in this situation were all that aware of the problem, at least in the in the aftermath, the immediate aftermath. Although sure. I'm pretty sure anhydrous ammonia, although it's colorless, it is not smellless. I think it's pretty powerful. I don't know. Smell. This is an agonizing death for those people. It's it's, yeah. uh, it's awful stuff. Um, mm. So there, I mean, the, the fact that there's a tanker on the side of the road and you smell something really off is 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 you know something that humans can do <laughs> that that vehicles cannot do yet. They do not have smell o vision yet. Well, I'm sure the AVs are going to be built with mass spectrometers that constantly analyze the environment to make sure there are no chemical substances that are going to kill the pedestrians. So wouldn't you think that's a important part of vehicle design? Uh, uh, on board yeah, automatically operating spectrometer uh, i mean they put it on they put it on uh, vehicles that they sent to mars why not put it on the vehicle that they you know sent to los angeles they save pennies not putting immobilizers in cars for him come on you think they're gonna do that really you're Sorry. so naive the youth Sorry. so naive hey let's talk safety drivers because uh mercedes has the first is this correct they have the first license to operate a level three uh well driver it's not autonomous a level three car which a level three car says hey under these certain Mm -hmm. conditions and these certain areas that we've pre-mapped out (laughs) um, you can take your hands off the wheel you don't necessarily have to pay attention yep and so uh ars technica uh they got to try one of these out in uh, los angeles area and when the the traffic the you know bumper to bumper traffic dropped below 40 miles per hour the system's like hey go ahead we got it it goes above 40 miles per hour it's like nope we ain't got it anymore you're taking over fred's pointed out numerous times in this podcast uh that the reaction time for humans in these scenarios eh, it's a needs a little more time than just hey on off like wait what um but this is um a mercedes you know has done a decent job and it's not just because i want them to give me one uh from the article the driver cannot doze off though nor can they recline or spend too much time turned around talking to rear seat passengers a camera tracks the driver's eyes and head movement to ensure that they're ready to take over duties at a moment's notice more amazing with this they call this thing drive pilot uh confidence in drive pilot is high within mercedes benz as the system has been active in germany for over a year without incident that confidence is demonstrated by Mercedes' decision to assume liability for the vehicle while drive pilot is in use. Some conditions Civil may apply. Liability too. When you say that, you have to classify it because yeah. they can assume all the liability they want in that scenario. But if a criminal court decides that you're responsible as a driver, it doesn't matter what Mercedes says. Oh, really? Oh, so that's total BS then? Essentially. Oh. I mean, they, they're assuming a certain amount of civil liability, they, but you would have to prove that it was actually the vehicle's fault, right, in order for them to accrue that. So this doesn't stop a lawsuit from happening. It doesn't stop a criminal case from happening. But it does, at some point, if you can prove to Mercedes <laughs> that their vehicle was or, or their their software was at fault here, then they say they will assume liability. We'll see what their lawyers say behind closed doors. Okay, so this is operating below 40 miles per hour. So, like, see, you, you, you tap another car in front of you going 35 miles per hour. Um, you know, that's, you know, pretty much your insurance is going to be like, you haven't even met the threshold for deductible on this. You're, you're paying the 750 bucks to an autobody. 
Yeah, well, I mean, I'm more pretty sure your Mercedes. insurance company isn't going to be going after uh, Mercedes. Mercedes to try to get that money. I mean, it's it's kind of silly. Um, the other thing about these cars that's a little weird is that they obviously it's only going to be used in traffic areas, but it requires you know they call it drive pilot, but it requires a vehicle to be in front of your car for 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 your car to follow, which suggests right. that the real pilot may be in the car in front of you. I'm not ah. sure how that works. Um, but it's it's you know it's conditional automation. They've been approved in I think Nevada, California, to do this, um, and we're gonna you know see how it works. We're really concerned about the 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 takeover scenario. You know, you're in 40 mile per hour traffic, it comes on, and then all of a sudden the traffic eases and people are zooming ahead. You're stuck on your phone on a video conference or doing whatever you're able to do um while the system's in operation and you can't take over in time what happens there um are we going to see accidents i mean crashes caused by you know that that lack of of guaranteed takeover i mean there is no guarantee that humans are going to do anything um you can set up these systems to make it more likely that the human's going to take over with a certain period of time but you can't guarantee anything once they've relaxed into a state where they're not responsible or don't think they're responsible I, for the operation. i figured out the solution i'm going to sell a brick that you just put on the accelerator pedal the entire time so when the system's engaged that's not going to do anything but when it disengages boom i'm zooming Look at That's that. the original oh. autopilot. <laughs> well, this article, uh, I guess, is going to be posted on our website, but uh, yep. it's a, it's very much a booster article, and the driver talked about how cool it was. Um, I, I want to point out, though, that the test drive did not include following a leading driver who was drunk, did not include the response during torrential rain. That, that happens, right? Um, it did not include the response during a dust storm. Or a brush fire. We, if anybody reads newspapers, knows that these things happen. Um, did not. Has no evidence that it worked properly while stuck in a traffic jam, and the fire truck is trying to make its way through, uh, working through the traffic because some idiot blocked the breakdown lane. Um, there's no evidence that it includes an anhydrous ammonia detector to get you the hell out of the car when poison gases are spewing over the highway and the assumption of liability by mercedes includes a two thousand dollar per year subscription fee so if you're getting all these wonderful benefits you're spending two thousand dollars a year or another way of thinking of it is twenty some odd thousand dollars over the typical lifetime of a car that's owned by a single owner that so, sounds uh, like an insurance policy yeah well, well clearly right. you're not a mercedes driver fred i was once Oh, okay. Well, was once. hey, does uh, can I get an, a youthful <laughs> indiscretion, which I will never repeat? Can I get an anhydrous ammonia detector at a Piggly Wiggly? No, you cannot. Oh, it's well, just this damn know. shame they should have them because they certainly generate a lot. Oh, my word. Hey, we're running low on time, but can we? So, uh, last week's uh, Tower Fred, it was all about GPS and in depth. Can we and and some of our listeners are just like, wait a second, you threw too much tech babble at me. Are you becoming a tech bro? Translate it to uh, American. You've now entered the so, Dow uh, Yeah, we'll go ahead and do that. I'll give you five seconds here for the intro. Now, just thousand, jump one, into thousand, it. Two thousand. <laughs> no. Okay, fine. Uh, what are the critical components of GPS? Well, first is a server. Now, what is a server? A server is basically a very competent computer somewhere that is programmed to give automated responses to whatever is happening around it. Um, so it's, it's, it's technically a lot like the computer you have sitting on your desk, but it has many, many processors and it can handle a lot of inputs and outputs. So the critical component is that there's a GPS mapping server, this big powerful computer, and that has access to geospatial databases. It knows the location of fixed points that are near your vehicle because it's already done its homework mapping the world. It has the ability to create a graphical map image, and it has the ability to receive geospatial data from your vehicle that's being generated in real time to allow it to map the vehicle against its known reference points. So it, it mixes up all this information, and then it creates a map 
a, a picture that it can send to your vehicle that then gets updated on your vehicle. And there's several ways of doing that. But the point is that as you move, you're constantly getting new maps sent to your vehicle that allow you to uh, locate your vehicle relative to the geographical points around you. And typically, the server has also mapped out a route that it wants you to follow or expects you to follow so that it has a couple of virtues. Number one, it tells you whether or not you're on route. The other is that it narrows the scope of the analysis that it has to do because it figures out what are the points you're likely to encounter as you go down this road. So it, it, it helps from computing that way. Um, it also needs a way of communicating with your car in both directions. Your car is sending it information about where the car is located. The computer is sending you back information, which is a basically map that can be projected into your car. That connection in civilian applications anyway, is usually done using cell phone technology. Um, so how does it know what your relative location is? Well, it has mapped previously certain locations that are in the world. It knows where certain servers are. It knows where certain um, routers are, certain cell towers. And when it, when it knows where these locations are, these fixed locations, it can calculate your car's location relative to those based upon the signal strength, for example, or the cell tower might be reporting your location relative to its own. And it sends out, the, you know, you can visualize a bunch of circles that are being sent out from all these different sources that say, well, the car is somewhere within this fuzzy band that represents the location and the distance and uncertainty in distance from the, the source where I know the location, right? So, so this is like those those crime shows where like, we got a ping on the cell tower. We think we know uh, who they are. Oh, we've right. got a ping on this other. And then they figure out, oh, they're in this building and they're wearing these shoes. Right, but the cell tower pinging uh, it actually works, but it's only going to tell you within, we'll say 100 feet, 200 feet, something like that, where you're located. Now, if you've only got one cell tower, what this means is there's a big circle, a big fuzzy circle around the cell tower, and you're somewhere within that big fuzzy circle. But if you've got two cell towers, then you have to be somewhere within the two fuzzy circles that are generated, right? So you've got a you've got a narrower space, but it's still pretty fuzzy. Now, if you've got three cell towers, it's still fuzzy circles, but it's a smaller area within those three fuzzy circles where everything overlaps, right? Kind of like a Venn diagram. So the circles, if they were perfect, would tell you exactly where you are. But the circles are fuzzy, so there's still some some fuzz in the location. That's okay with the GPS because it says, well, I'm, I'm just going to put a dot in the middle of all this uncertainty and say that's where you're likely to be. I'm going to put that dot in the map, and I'm going to send it to your car. It's, and it's probably pretty much right. It's probably right enough for the person using it. And that's kind of the way it works. You receive it over the cell phone technology as well. Hazards that are known only show up if they've been loaded into the database by some human being. Like last week, we talked about the poor gentleman who drove off a, uh, a road when the bridge was out. Nobody had ever reported that to the utility that he was using. So there was no way for the server to know or to understand that that location was a forbidden location. Well, in that so, case, a lot of people reported it. It just, uh, Google, unfortunately, just ignored all of those reports. Right. So you've got human beings at both ends of it. It's, it's, a human being's got to report it. A human being's got to update the information into the database. And probably another human being's got to say, yeah, that's valid information. So there are there are human defects involved in this. And like the lawsuit probably says, if you assume people are going to use this for life making decisions, then you have to also have a responsibility to make sure that the service responds to that need and actually puts the important information in the database. So the people relying on it for their lives uh, don't die, right? So actually, this is the same point we've been making about AVs. They have lots of hidden safety-critical features 
that no human being can ever inspect. You can't look at it and say, well, you know, this parameter associated with safe, uh, adaptive, uh, what am I struggling for? Adaptive cruise control. All these parameters are working properly. There's no way of uh, visually inspecting that. There's got to be a responsibility for the company to identify failures when they occur and report them out. Um, that's not being done, but that's that's a slightly different issue. So uh, is that clear, Anthony and Michael? Does that give you a better idea of how this GPS works? Yeah, fuzzy circles. Fuzzy circles, yeah. <laughs> but when, when I... Um... I'm using my phone and I do not have my wireless turned on. Sometimes my phone will say, Hey, you need to turn on your wireless so we can get a more accurate GPS location for you. Right. How does, is it using my Wi Fi router as one of the reference points in mapping my location? Yes. How is it? I've always wondered what's going on there. Why does it need, why is, why is my, why is my location going to be more accurate with, with, G, with a Wi Fi? Can, Probably can your router. There? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so uh, there's a class action lawsuit filed against Google like in 2010, 2011, where their street mapping software went out there and mapped everybody's home Wi-Fi routers without permission. Um, and so that's what they did is because most people don't change that. So they can go, hey, this is, you know, Michael's Wi-Fi. There's a hidden address associated with that, a machine address. And they put that in their database. And most people don't move their Wi-Fi routers around. So they use that point as part of their mapping thing. Because especially when you're in large cities, sometimes GPS signals can't get through because of buildings and, you know, people putting aluminum foil on their heads. So they're not just mapping our roads. They're mapping our secret Wi-Fi routers. That's well, they're mapping the, they're mapping the roads relative to your your Wi-Fi router, and they're mapping your Wi-Fi router relative to the cell tower locations because the cell tower locations are fixed. They're known, right. and they can be identified individually. So, right. yeah, there's you, actually there is a vehicle that drives down the street with specialized equipment that listens in on your router. Now, again, we're talking about the fuzziness, right? So it's relying on the signal strength from your router to tell exactly where it is based on you know, the signal strength when the car goes by. So if they know exactly where the car is, they know exactly where your router is, and they know exactly what the signal strength is, they can get a pretty good location. None of those things are exact, so, so that all contributes to the fuzz and the location that they've got. So yes, they certainly want you to turn your, your router on and use that as part of their location service. And so the GPS server has to be able to handle requests from millions of people at once, basically, right? I mean, anytime someone's using an app on their phone that requires GPS, I'd probably do that, I don't know, 20, 100 times a day. I'm not even sure. So, yeah. And, and each, so the way the servers are built up, is the the bunch of what they call I think they call them card servers, but basically each one of those computer cards is a complete computer that's got a lot of capability, might be able to handle ten or twenty requests or a hundred requests, something like that. But there's a server farm somewhere that has thousands of these plug-in computers uh, in the server farm, so that it's able to process all of those millions of requests that are coming in essentially simultaneously. Now, there is a lag involved in that. You may have noticed when you're driving down the road and you don't take the recommended turn that the computer wants you to take, it takes 10, 15, sometimes 30 seconds for it to catch up and say, hey, you dummy, you didn't go the way I wanted you to go, so now I'm going to have to calculate a new route. That lag, that interval is, is associated with the uncertainties in the location and the ability to update the location in the server based upon your actual location versus the predicted location. Makes sense. It's a good conversation stopper. If you're ever in a, <laughs> if you're ever in a cocktail party and you, you know, you, you want to get away from the person you're talking to, just bring up subjects like this. It works every time. Oh my God. Uh, pay attention to Fred Perkins, other podcast, how to lose friends and leave a party. Uh, hey, let's uh, jump into our weekly segment called Rearview Image May Not Display. I mean, sorry, Recall Roundup. 
Uh, recall Roundup, the first one, I, I gave it away. Rear view image may not display. This is Chrysler, uh, 272,000 plus vehicles. They're recalling certain 2022, 2023 Ram 1500, Ram 3500, uh, Ram, a bunch of Ram. You got a Ram. Check this out. Uh, and this is a weird one because the remedy says dealers will update the radio software free of charge. So the radio software may prevent the rear view image from displaying. One, who's listening to AM or FM radio? If so, you're on a list. Okay. Uh, and how does this affect a rear view camera? Like what, what engineering meeting did this occur on? Hey guys, uh, you know that CCD camera we have in the back of the car? What would be cool if it, it pulled in Casey Kasem's top 10 hits? Is that what happened there? Yeah, well, I, think, you know, I don't know what I think happened here. Golden Go oldies, golden oldies station. Somebody mistook the rear view for looking back at some of the golden oldies. I think that was what happened. Crazy. Uh, I mean, it's just another another product of trying to integrate, you know, infotainment and other types of software with with the same systems that are running safety critical software. Something that we probably don't think should be done. No. Hey, if you're an engineer in one of these things or you're a project manager in one of these, please just, you know, you can anonymously write into us and tell us like what the thought process behind this is. Is it an honest mistake? We're all humans. We've made mistakes. Or is it just kind of like, no, this is a, you know, a bean counter said this is a cost saving measure or it was just kind of like, I don't know, you just wire went this way. Like, I, I'm really curious. I don't know. Uh, moving on. Uh, Hyundai Kia. Automatic, oh wait, no, ABS fire recall. That's all it says in my notes. There's no the, link. There's nothing. This is just a tease. Yeah, there was a very large um, recall from Hyundai and Kia last week. They are having, um, in fact, um, if you look back in history, my understanding is that this is the 16th and 17th recall on ABS um, problems involving this component in the past 10 years. So this has been a, a long ongoing issue. In this case, the, um, these analog brake system is what I'm saying when I say ABS. Uh, the brake fluid, some brake fluid is leaking through an O ring that degrades over time, getting onto the HECU, which is the hydraulic electronic control unit for the analog brake system shorting it out and causing um fires and you know it's this was this recall was influenced by nitsa pursuant to the investigation that has been open for about five years now since we petitioned over the fires we were seeing in some of these vehicles a lot of those fires were related to the engine problem where, you know, the, the, they had a bearing failure and, you know, one of the rods from the engine, a connecting rod, pierces the engine, allows oil to flow out on the hot surface of the vehicle and causes fires. This one is a completely, when we were looking at the complaints before we filed our petition, we continued to see other types of fires. There were fires that appeared to be related to the electrical system that you know we saw a lot of melting around lights there were a lot of other little things we saw fires that were occurring when the vehicle wasn't in motion which you know is is definitely not an engine related fire all of those occurred when the vehicle was on and moving um this abs problem can occur no matter what the car is doing the, the way they manufactured these units they're on all the time 24 7 and so this failure can occur at any time when your car is parked in your garage and you're asleep so there's also a park outside warning for those recalls so um if you have one of these hyundai's you need to get into the dealership fast get your theft software installed and make sure that you've got all of your engine software installed so that you qualify for that part of the extended warranty. And now make sure that you've got this ABS recall performed. Um, one of the issues here is that they're not replacing the O-ring that's allowing the brake fluid to leak. They're not replacing the ABS unit that's been a problem. I mean, there's this the 17th recall, 16th and 17th recalls on it. They are replacing a fuse on the um, hydraulic electric control unit that's part of the ABS to prevent the short circuit. So we still have a lot of questions. That seems like the cheapest possible fix they could do here. It might prevent the fire, but 
what's it doing about all that leaky brake fluid? And, you know, you know, it's another situation where we're looking at the manufacturer going, why haven't you fixed the real defect here that's causing the problem? Why are you just mitigating it? So they're putting a Band-Aid on arterial bleeding. Is that what you're telling me? Yes. Mm. Mm. Bad and with approach. that. With that, folks, I'm gonna I'm gonna call this a wrap for this episode. Um, we we've stolen enough of your time, but you know, hey, we didn't do it for free because you went there and you donated. Autosafety.org, you donated. You told all your friends, didn't you? Donate? Why didn't you donate? I know where you are. You have your GPS turned on. We're tracking you. That aluminum foil isn't gonna cut it. We've mapped out your router. None of those things are true, um, except for you're donating. So, hey, thanks, uh, everybody, and we'll be back next week with another exciting episode of Rearview Camera Failures. <laughs> Thank you, folks. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for listening. For more information, visit www.autosafety.org.